it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello, my darlings. Lovely to see you all. Uh, notice I have a new memory card now. New memory card, new me. <laughs> well, you know, same old me, but uh, new memory card. Uh, today I have a ton of stuff, some of it left over from last time, including the Queen's Health. I thought we'd take a look at uh, Her Majesty's Health, see how that's going to go. Plus, I took an 11th hour look at the gubernatorial race in Virginia between Yunkin and McAuliffe, because that's still neck and neck. Plus, Letitia James, who is currently the Attorney General of New York, but is thinking of running for governor next year. What are her chances of success? I took a look at that. Plus, I did the Serapium. Don't even ask. I have no idea. <laughs> it's some kind of temple in Egypt, apparently. And somebody said, will you take a look at that? Because it's all mysterious. There is these enormous granite boxes that got in there somehow, but nobody knows how. And uh, so I thought, oh, all right, I'll do pictures for this. Plus, I did transition pictures for General George Patton. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Lovely to see you too. To the donors, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you and a thousand more thank yous. <laughs> Whatever it takes, really, to show my gratitude for your donations. I really, really am grateful for your support. Thank you. And obviously to the commenters, really interesting comments as always. I am very grateful for those. Let's get on because we've got a lot to get through. And I wanted to start with the governor's race in Virginia between the Democrat Terry McAuliffe, who was governor before, uh, from 2014 to 2018, and on the Republican side, Glenn Youngkin. Glenn Youngkin is worth a whopping $400 million. He was CEO of the Carlyle Group, which is like a private equity firm, an investment company, for about 25 years, and amassed an enormous fortune. The question is why would you want to be governor if you had that kind of money? Why invite the hassles? Just go to Acapulco, drink margaritas for the rest of your life and be happy. Or maybe I'm projecting. <laughs> but with the race neck and neck, I thought it'd be interesting to do the individual energies of the candidates and see how they were faring. Beginning with Glenn Youngkin. When I went into his energy, he was entering a tight little valley just in this last stretch. And it was guarded by two enormous statues sitting in thrones, like something out of an old Sinbad movie. Democrat, Republican, maybe? Or one's the media? Or something. I don't know what they represented, but they were guarding this valley. And he walks between them in awe. Maybe there's a little trepidation here now. It's becoming real. He might, at the end of this process, be governor. Oh my God, maybe I should have gone to Acapulco. Maybe this wasn't a good idea. It's a little daunting when you get to this stage. But he walks down the valley and he emerges at the other side. And there is a kind of natural rock platform which overlooks this vast sunny landscape. Now don't forget that even if he loses the governor's position, he's still got a ton of money. His life will be great. So he is going to feel good whether he wins or loses. It's just a little blow to his pride for Yunkin. So I had a look at Terry McAuliffe as well and see what happened to him. And he, like so many of these guys who are pretty confident of how they're going, he was on a skateboard, kind of whooping it up, sliding this way and that, enjoying himself. But he too, in this final stretch, entered a valley. But the valley had a tunnel too. And the tunnel was dark, full of worry and anxiety. This was a lot of pressure on him. But he skateboards through the tunnel, and when he emerges, he is at the head of a vast U-shaped glacial valley. You know those valleys that the ice carved this kind of U out of? Stretching into the distance. And he could just stay on his skateboard and go down this valley. But you see why I can never tell who wins and who loses. Both felt exhilarating. The views were splendid for both candidates. Both went into a kind of shadowy area afterwards, like, oh, I've got to get down to business now. I have no idea. McAuliffe could be the winner, I suppose, because the signs on the Republican side are not 
particularly enthusiastic or optimistic. Trump, for example, refused to go to Virginia and support Yunkin. I'm not going. He's not worth it. You know, that kind of thing. He just was reluctant. And they were plugging away at the voter fraud idea even before people had voted, suggesting that internal polling for the Republican Party was saying bad things, like Youngkin's not going to make it. But we'll see, very soon. Uh, the pictures, though, were fairly even-handed, suggesting that the neck-and-neck -neck status is pretty true. I also took a look at the Queen's health. Her Majesty has been ailing, she's been in hospital, people are really worried. That woman has been on the throne since 1952. She's 95 already, and she still keeps up a busy schedule. But she's had to cancel her attendance at the Climate Change Conference, which is in Scotland. I mean, it's just down the road from her house. And the doctor said, no, you're Madge, which is how they refer to her, I'm sure. You're Madge, you've got to stay in the house. You can't go out. No conferences for you. So I thought I'd take a look at her energy. I don't do death pictures because I think that's unsavory, frankly. But when I went into the energy for Her Majesty, there was a wall and she was floating in front of this wall, which I didn't think was necessarily a good sign. She wasn't walking like people do when they're under their own steam. She was floating in front of it and reflecting on how far she'd come. And the wall had thousands of red buttons on it going way into the past and she would come along and she would go I will press this one and I will press that one and each one represented a duty a responsibility some fulfillment of an engagement and that one and this one and what about that one no your majesty don't press <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she pressed all these buttons as she was floating in front of this wall. But then comes this spate of illness. And she leans against the wall and goes, Oh, God, this is all too much. Oh, so many things I have to do. So many obligations. You know, she's kind of like worn out. And I looked ahead. And there were more buttons, hundreds of them going into the distance, but they were grey. Now, maybe a lot of them are thrown into chaos because who knows whether she'll be able to fulfil them or not. And then there was a mist. Now, mists, as we know, are problems, uncertainties, not quite sure how things are going to work out. And I think that must be the energy around her right now, that they don't know if she's going to recover full health or whether she's going to have to say, you know, I'm 95 kids, I've done my bit, I'm stopping, because I can't continue anymore. And it brings on a crisis uh, within the monarchy. But right now, I look down the line, and all these buttons were incredibly vague, going into the mist, which makes things even vaguer. So if people around her are worried, uh, I think it's justifiable. I was also asked to look at something called the Serapium in Saqqara in Lower Egypt. I had no idea what a Serapium was. It's some kind of temple, I think, dedicated to the god Serapis. <laughs> but anyway, even if it isn't, there were pyramids there where kings of Egypt were buried. And this Serapium thing was uh, built in maybe 1350 BC, but not really uncovered, excavated, until the 19th century. And when they did excavate it, they found a tunnel like three quarters of a mile long under the ground with chambers in it. And in the chambers, somebody had left gigantic granite boxes each one weighing about 100 metric tons. And I don't really know the metric system, but that seems heavy to me. <laughs> and the lid and the box were carved out of the same piece of granite, but inside there was a cavity, which was so immaculately carved that even today, with modern tools, it would be hard for somebody to carve the hole, the cavity, that precisely. And the ancient Egyptians did not have tools that could do this. So it's a huge mystery. Somebody said they were for mummified bulls 
or something. Bulls were sacred back then, and when a bull died, they would uh, mummify it and stick it in one of these cavities. So I went into the energy. I thought, you know, it's very hard to do boxes in a tunnel, but <laughs> I'll give it a go. And when I found this place, the Serapium, there was a piece of parchment paper wrapped around something and held together at the back with a bulldog clip. I thought, well, I've got to look inside that. Let's have a look and see what it is. So I tear away the paper and there is a triangular cover on the ground, like a Toblerone, and it's covering a hole. I'm thinking, okay, well, I have no idea what that is. But just then, this enormous guy comes along and he goes up to the Toblerone, kneels down beside it and flicks it aside the way you would with the uh, lid of a Tic Tac box or something. Just flicks it aside. Even though it's enormous and heavy, it just rolls away. It does reveal a hole. And this enormous guy has a couple of boxes with him, those 100 metric ton boxes, and in his hands they're like pencils. So easy to lift. And he reaches down and he puts them inside the hole. Then tucks them to one side, like that, just tucks them underneath into various chambers. Like you would if you had a strong box under your floorboards. You lift up the floorboards, you put the strong box in, you tuck it in, put the floorboards back down. It was like that. And once he was finished, he just covers it up with soil and walks off. Don't ask. I have no idea. This is more, I did warn you, this is more mysterious than the original mystery. Who was that colossal guy? Now, there were theories I've seen put around about it. Oh, it's aliens. Yeah, okay, we may not understand the technology by which they managed to get these heavy boxes into the ground, but I think simply going to the alien option is a bit of a cop-out. <laughs> there must be some rational explanation, we just don't know what it is, and my pictures don't help in the slightest. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to Letitia James. She is running for the governorship of New York, which is a really weird situation because it was Letitia James, who is the Attorney General of New York currently, who investigated Andrew Cuomo, who was the governor until this summer. And because of her report about sexual harassment and stuff, he was forced to resign. And Kathy Hochul, who was his lieutenant governor, took the office instead. Now she is hoping to run for a full term next year when the elections come up in November. But of course, that would pit her, a Democrat, against Democrat Letitia James. So I thought it'd be interesting to just put those two together and see what the dynamic was between them. And when I found them side by side, Letitia James grabs Kathy Hochul and throws her on her back in a kind of like judo move. And Kathy laughs, it's like, oh, Tish, you are such a screwball. What's your game? And it's just like locker room horseplay, fun between friends. But Letitia James is not really joking. It was just a bit of a move to show her power. Anyway, Kathy Hochul gets up and goes, I don't have any more time for this. I'm governor, I've got things to do. See ya, and off she runs. And Letitia James watches her go and thinks, hmm, she's actually pretty good at this job. She is one to beat. I need to be a little bit more radical to get to the finish line before her. And so she runs over here, a bit like a cartoon character, really fast round the back way. And that's okay for a little while, but then it goes down a hill. And halfway down the hill, she looks up at Kathy Hochul, who's above her, and goes, ooh, that woman is doing really well, and I'm down here, and this isn't good. What's more, she can see that there's a tunnel. There so often is in these races. This is where a lot of flack is thrown at them. And this tunnel actually had vines inside that clawed at her as she went past. They were sticky. It was like, oh dear, there's some stuff going to come up about Letitia James probably. This is not going to be an easy race for her. She's going to have to go through the same stuff that a lot of other candidates go through when they run for a seat. But she comes through the other side, through the vines. There are some steps up. She comes to the top of the steps and thinks, oh, well, I'm through that. Where's Kathy Hochul? 
Kathy Hochul is over there. She's taken a different path entirely and is running into the distance. Tish James continues on the path that she's just found, which leads to a kind of plinth. Now, I don't know where Kathy Hochul went. And so I thought, I better follow her and see what happens. And after a while, she felt like she needed to get back on track. Maybe taking this particular path wasn't a good idea. Maybe she'd been too confident. And she took a little ladder, climbed up onto a higher path, and then ran along there. But by the time she got back to the start point, Tish James was on her little plinth. So it could be that both these women are equally capable of doing the governor job. And if Kathy Hochul proves herself over the next year, it could be quite hard for Tish James to uh, nab the job from under her. But uh, you never know, Kathy Hochul looks like she kind of goes off at a tangent and then comes back and finds that Tish James is an admirable opponent. I also took another look at the January the 6th committee to see how they're getting along and what their report might look like eventually. Uh, if you remember, I did them before and there was a crab, which everybody thought was a spider, but it was a crab. And if it got sidetracked and went down that little hill, it got washed away. And there've been plenty of attempts to sidetrack the committee, but they continued, they went ahead and I left it there. So I thought I'd do it again to see how things were going. When I went into the energy this time, there was the committee walking along and it was dragging a shovel with it. And it goes along a certain distance and then sticks its shovel in the ground and heaves out a whole pile of dirt. But in the dirt on the shovel, there are all these wriggly white things. And when I looked down the hole, it was almost brimming with maggots. Not maggots, but ma well, maybe maggots, but uh, maggots. Clearly, they are getting to the bottom of this and they have uncovered some pretty nasty stuff. What happened then in the pictures was that they cordoned off the area where they'd been digging almost like a crime scene, which it probably is. But they cordoned it off. And then once they'd done that and they kind of assessed it, this is presumably the report that they draw up in the end, they went to one side and started dragging it along the ground, like you would a quilt or something or a duvet. You're just dragging it along the ground. And it drags this quilt over a hill and when it gets over the other side, it lays it out on the ground. It spreads it out for everybody to see. And there were thousands of people gathered below to see this quilt. And the committee, which is probably their report, I'm guessing, but the committee then points to it and goes, there you go. That's it. That's what we found. And I honestly felt that there was such gobsmacked awe among the crowd. There was like silence and horror maybe and a sense of oh my god. Now the interesting thing was that it was dark on the other side of this hill where the crowd was. Some of them had torches and stuff. It was like they were looking up in darkness at this illuminated report, this quilt. And it made me think that either something goes on around the revelations in this report, so things get darker for a while because it exposes something that didn't want to be exposed, or there are distractions. Somebody state, Republicans I assume, stage some kind of massive distraction to deviate from, to take eyes away from, what's in the report, because that's the way that they do these things. But for a time, the crowd, thousands of people, stared up at the hillside and this quilt of information, interviews, facts, and were just horrified. And finally, I did transition pictures for General George Patton. 
He died in uh, 1945 at the age of 60 after a very, very illustrious military career in the U.S. Army. He was a West Point guy. He fought in World War I. He led several battalions during World War II and just became famous, notorious, legendary, whichever one you want to use, for being a fabulously charismatic and brave and visionary leader who inspired tremendous confidence in people. You could be worn out and not have an ounce of fight left in you. And after five minutes talking to General Patton, you'd want to get up and continue fighting. He was that kind of inspirational guy. And it was kind of ironic, actually, how he died because he'd come off the back of World War II in 1945 and he was taking some time off. I think he had problems towards the end of his military career and was a little despondent, but he took time off to go pheasant hunting with a friend. And on the way there, the car crashed. He hit his head on the glass in front of him, in the seat in front of him, and he broke his neck and back, I think, and was paralyzed from the neck down. It was a tragic and ironic end to a man who'd endured so many conflicts over so many years. And uh, in the end, he died of pulmonary edema and some kind of congestive heart failure thing. It was very, very sad and unfortunate and a terrible way for a man of such distinction, a military man of such distinction, to end his career. But I took a look at these pictures thinking, well, this will be quite interesting. I had not done a soldier before. And when I went in to the cave thing, I always see this metaphorical cave. He arrived almost like a superhero, which you would expect. He landed so hard in front of me that he actually cracked, in a metaphorical way, cracked the ground he was standing on. But immediately, he had a problem. When he walked... And there was no real resistance to any of this. But when he walked, he walked as if he'd been shot in the thigh, dragging his leg behind him. Now, you don't need to do that in this environment. In the transition phase, all ailments and incapacities go away. You're free. You're liberated from that. For some reason, he couldn't let go. And it was so fascinating how what shouldn't have been a struggle, what shouldn't have been any kind of fight at all, became in his hands a struggle and a fight. Because he dragged his leg halfway up the tunnel that's always there, the one that leads to the light at the top, and he became completely despondent. I was sort of like, why me? as if he'd had some kind of invincibility grafted onto his identity. Why me? This is terrible. He saw himself in his own consciousness at this particular point as a loser, as a leader who'd let his side down, as if by showing fallibility, he'd betrayed his reputation as a survivor. And he couldn't accept that. He was fighting after he'd stopped fighting. He was still dying after he died. He couldn't let go of what he'd been through. He carried on walking up the tunnel to the chamber where the light is. He was not only witnessing his mortal death, He was witnessing the death of his expectations, of his illusory invincibility. He spent so many years fighting that peace, when it arrived, and this was total peace he was facing, was almost unacceptable to him. Maybe he dodged death so many times during his career that the fact that it had caught up with him finally was something he couldn't even get his head around. And he dragged his leg, which was fine and not an encumbrance at all, but he made it into an encumbrance. He dragged it over to the light and sat on the rim there, despairing, confused, unable to really rationalize what had happened. 
And I thought, what if I go in and have a look through his consciousness, I align with that and see what he's seeing? And sure enough, it was startling. There were bombs going off. There were people lying on the ground. There was commotion and chaos and bangs and gunfire and people running. It was just this massive tumult, like a fever dream of horror. And that's what filled his consciousness after decades of fighting. There was no peace there. There was no room for peace there. This was a guy who had come off the back of World War II and didn't know peace. And when I came out of his consciousness, he just gave a groan. He lay down on the rim of the light, still unable to process what had happened, but too weak at this point to resist anymore. It's like, just take me. Let's just go. I don't even want to think about this anymore. And General Pan rolled into the light and was gone. And you know, it reminded me of something I wrote in Why Your Life Matters about a thing called destiny points. I have this theory that each of us has a number of destiny points in our life. Maybe half a dozen for most of us, four, five, six, something like that. And a destiny point is that moment where our life, our existence, becomes important to the whole. Everything else is just filler. But at certain points in our life, we become important to somebody else. For example, a child runs into traffic and before a bus can hit it, you run, grab the child and pull it out of harm's way. And then years later, that child grows up to be a great physicist, which it wouldn't have done had you not been there in that precise moment. Or somebody is walking along the street thinking of ending it all, like life is too hard. And you come along and just smile at the person. You just smile and it makes their day and it restores their faith in human nature. The thing about destiny points is that they're not something that we can plan. They're not something that we understand in advance will be part of our contract while we're on the planet. We are just there, we act spontaneously, we do something that impacts somebody else. And for the briefest time, it's not about us. It's about somebody else. And this is what struck me with General Patton because some people, Patton, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, these giants, uh, Steve Jobs, they come along and they have maybe one destiny point. And their destiny point was simply to exist and do something great. And their entire life was dedicated to this one thing and they changed the world because of that. We may, as individuals, change the world in little ways without ever knowing. But the greats, when they come along, their destiny point is their very life. They are here to change the world. And with General Patton, that seemed to be true. Which is why, when he got to the dome, he couldn't handle his demise. He couldn't handle the very idea of peace because his destiny point was to wage war with enemies who would otherwise destroy his country and destroy the world. By dying so young and in a dumb car accident as well, he felt like he had given up, that he was a loser. And when he rolled over into the arms of unconditional love, he would find that none of that is true. That's a mortal thing. There are no losers. There are no failures. Everybody wins in the eyes of grace.
And that's what I learnt from General George Patton. Alright, thanks very much for watching guys. I really appreciate it. Um, like, subscribe, share if you would, that'd be great. Uh, follow me on Twitter, at Cash Peters. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.